Hi, I'm Santa Claus. Um, okay, maybe not Santa Claus. Hi, I'm Cleve Bourbon. I've uh, written books like um, The Red Mage Ascending, which is my uh, Term of Mages series. And I've, I've written an entire epic fantasy series uh, called The Shadows of the First Trine, which is all available in my links down below. But uh, today, uh, as promised several times and um, finally delivering, I'm doing another um, editing. Well, I'm doing another grammar slash author tube. This is kind of a, a hybrid. It's kind of author tube slash grammar because uh, we're going to talk about self-editing today on uh, this video and um, how to do it. Now, I've been asked to do this by several different authors. Um, apparently, in the author tube out there, there's a lot of... Um, People that talk about self-editing and 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 even maybe show a little bit about how to self-edit, but they don't really have a, a plan or something they can show. They can do like a workshop. They can workshop it and actually teach you, which is what I'm going to be doing today. So I'm going to try it. This may be in two parts um, because I don't know how long this is going to be. I'll try to make it brief. Um, before I get to that part, sorry about my little <laughs> um, cords or thing hanging down, but anyway. Uh, before I get started, uh, I am working on Gunpowder, Magic, and Lead, and that'll be one of the examples I'm going to show you today with the editing portion of the video. Um, uh, so the book I started in, uh, and failed to finish in the month of November, and I'm still writing it here in the month of uh, December. I'm hoping to get it done by the end of the year, but I will. that's one of the examples I will be using will be that book, that novel. So um, without any more, well... I don't like to say without further ado, because I think everybody says that, but I guess without further ado, let's talk about self-editing, okay? So the first thing about self-editing is that it's very difficult, and there's a reason why it's difficult, and that reason is because self-editing requires you to use your analytical side of your brain. Now, this is going to, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my um, degree stuff here, um, so we're going to get a little bit technical, so bear with me. So technically what happens is when you create, you're using the right side of your brain and you're creating your, your work and you're you're making it where you um, make up things and you, some authors say life for a living or whatever, or you make up stories and scenarios. That's your creative side of your brain. Now your editing side of your brain is the analytical side. And it comes from the left hemisphere of your brain. So that's why uh, most time in creative writing courses and even my essay courses with students, I tell them do not try to edit and write at the same time. The reason why is because your creative side is on your right side is trying to write something and your analytical editing side is trying to edit it and they're actually working against each other because you're doing it from two different spots in your brain. So you can't switch back and forth. Now, you might say, well, as I write, um, Cleve, I edit as I go along. Well, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if you see a spelling error or, or if your word processor has a red line under it or something and says, hey, this is wrong, that's perfectly okay. What I'm talking about is trying to be a Mozart out there and write perfectly the first time, even though Mozart really didn't do that. But anyway, um, trying to write something perfect for the first time so that you don't have to go back and edit. You want to, a lot of students try to do this. They try to write the perfect essay and, with the first draft and try to skip the writing process. And um, there is, you can skip the writing process, but that's not very wise to do. And I'll show you why. The writing process goes as follows. Okay, so you have... Uh, and this is the scientific method kind of thing. Well, not really scientific method, but, you know, writing process. The first thing is you uh, you draft the, the first draft or write the first draft. So write the first draft. Okay, so this, this is the um, exact saying. I used to have a poster of this in my classroom. All right, so and after you write the first draft, your first draft is terrible. It's going to be the one that has all the warts and sticks and, you know, junk in it that you're may or may not like. Uh, a lot of times you'll forget what you've written when you've written that and you'll come back to it later, like in a day or so. They go, I don't like this part or, oh, that's really corny or something. And you don't catch that if you uh, if you don't do the writing stages right. If you don't do them correctly, I mean, meaning that if you don't uh, if you don't go back and look at your writing, you just think you've done if you try to uh create and edit at the same time and you think you don't have to go back and look at it again you're not going to catch any of the of the corniness and stuff that you're not going to like because you're not going back and reading it and i've, I've been a, i've been a 
uh, I've been guilty of that sometimes myself where I thought, well, <laughs> I've written it perfectly and you don't have to go back and do it, but that's not, that's not the case. Usually most of the time, nine times out of 10, uh, I go back and I look at something. And I'm like, Oh, that's, that's too corny. And I have to change it up some way. All right. So the first time you do any kind of revise or any kind of change to it, um, you do uh, your revise and edit. Okay. Revise edit stage. Okay. That's, that's stage number two. That's pro that's number two on the writing process is revising it. So as soon as you do any kind of revising or editing, if you change one word in your, your rough draft manuscript, then you automatically get the second draft, right? So while you're revising and edit, you get the second draft. Now, do any of you out there know the difference between revising and editing and proofreading? If you do not know the difference, the difference is when you revise and edit, you're changing whole paragraphs, you're changing whole chapters. If you're doing a long work, you might be taking a character out. You may be adding a character in. Um, you're making huge sweeping changes. Revising and editing is not small stuff. It is a um, complete um, overhaul. So sometimes the, sometimes the second draft can be another first draft and you have to do the revise and edit stage again because you've changed so much. Um, but anyway, so you have the first draft, you rip it apart. That's the revise and edit stage. You get the second draft. The second draft, then you proofread. Okay. The proofreading stage is polishing. That's where you try to polish your thing up and make it presentable. Um, you might have to repeat the revise and edit a couple of times before you get to the proofread stage after you get to the second draft where you're actually going to proofread it. Um, and, um, you know, that's okay. You, there's no... Um, there's no limit on how many drafts you can have, right? You don't want too many. You don't want to get to the point where you're never satisfied with it because there's always going to be something wrong. There's always going to be something you're going to be, you're your, you're your own worst critic. There's always something that you're going to be looking at that you're like, oh, that, I don't like that. And, but if you change it too much, you go back too many times to the well, um, sometimes you can make it worse. So you got to find that happy medium. Okay, so after you proofread, you get the third draft, right? So the third draft can be the final draft depending on how you did the uh, your proofreading or your advising edit stage, you might end up, it might be a third draft, it might be the fifth draft, you know. And then finally, the last one is publish or turn in. Um, if you're writing a paper, I, I, you have to understand this was for, this is for uh, high school and college students too. So uh, this is what was on the poster that I used to have in my classroom, publish or turn in. Now in our case with, pub, with the authors, it's publish. But um, this uh, this is self-editing. So where you would probably come into, if you're going to do like, um, if you want to do this for, say, you want to turn it into a traditional publisher or you're wanting to uh, send it to an editor, a freelance editor for further editing, then what you're going to do is when you get to this, this stage right here after the proofreading, that third draft or polish or turn in, that turn in is where you turn it into the publisher editor or you turn it to the freelance editor or you turn it to somebody else to further um, work on it. So that would make a final draft um, another step after that. But, okay, so this is very important for, me to, for everybody to understand. The first draft is always the worst draft. First draft, worst draft. Okay, think of it that way. Revise and edit and you get the second draft. Your second draft is just, it's better than your first draft, but it's not publishable. Okay, uh, then it goes to the proofreading phase. Now this is... Uh, your proofreading phase. This, you should go through these steps up to this point. You should go through those steps yourself without before you even get to an editor or any of any kind. That's this is your self-editing phase right here. Okay, this stuff right here is your self-editing phase. You should at least get these done before you ever think about turning into to, to a traditional publisher or a self uh, or a freelance publish uh, freelance. Okay, let me say it again. Before you turn it into a traditional editor which is the one that's going to look at your manuscript. And usually it's a junior editor that looks at your manuscript and either throws it in the slush pile or sends it on to the main editor for approval to get published. That's how you do it with the traditional or send it on to the freelance editor, which is the person who will further edit your work. Now take it a step further. Um, so that you end, up, you end up getting the third draft. And then uh, uh, this is your private personal editing. And then when you get to this point, here, that's when you turn do here. This is turning it into the 
traditional publisher, the traditional editor or the traditional, or I can't talk today, the traditional publisher or the freelance editor. Okay, I'm going to slow down a little bit so that I, I won't slur my words so much. All right, so can you skip to these stages? Yes, you can skip them. However, if you really want to be successful at, at self-publishing and at self-editing, don't skip them. Do them. Write the draft, revise and edit. This means go over the whole thing. This means you're going to have to probably read your own novel like three or four times at least. Um, two times at the, at the very least. Three times is better. Four times is even better than that. Uh, after that many times, I would think that you're going to have diminishing returns. I wouldn't I wouldn't continue to, to do it after that point because then you get to the point where you um, you'll get fatigued and you'll start, you know, it, it's just not good. Um, if, if any of you out there have tried before, then you know after about the fourth draft, fourth time you've done it, you need to put it set aside and take a few days because before you return to it because everything starts running together and you forget things and it's it's not good. So I think up to four times is good. Then you turn into the traditional editor. There, I said it perfectly. Or the freelance self-publishing editor. And then you can do the final draft that you actually use to format for your novel. And we'll talk a bit about formatting here in a minute. All right, so that's the writing process. And that's the writing process if you're doing an essay, a novel, a short story, it doesn't matter. It's all the same, all right? So that's the process you should, you should uh, adopt. All right, so here is the elephant in the room. Okay, if you're gonna self-edit and you have no idea of, of English grammar and the rules of grammar. I mean, it's pretty easy for me because I have degrees in English. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in English. So what, what about the, the person who just has a high school education or maybe even dropped out of high school? It's like, how, how do you know uh, what to look at to self-edit, uh, especially if you didn't really pay attention in English class or maybe you failed English or something? Well, here's where you get the resources. There are a lot of resources. Here's one that I used to use a long time ago. Uh, this is a pretty old book now. Um, grammatically correct. You can say it says the writer's essential guide to punctuation, spelling, style, usage, and grammar. Now, what all these are, punctuation is your, your marks, like your commas and your period usage and stuff like that. Spelling, you know what that is. Style could be like, style and usage could be, you know, depending on if you're like a novel writer, an author for a novel, um, you may spell... Like me, I don't use the American spelling for the word gray. I don't use G-R-A-Y. I use the British spelling G-R-E-Y because I write fantasy. And it just seems like gray with G-R-E-Y is more fantasy than G-R-A-Y. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but gray just, I don't know, it just feels better to me. So my style uh, that I use in my style sheet that I send to my editor will say I spell gray with G-R-E-Y. Uh, there's another author that was a fantasy author that he spelled wagon, G uh, W A G G O N instead of W A G O N, and he put that in his style guide for his editor, saying, "Don't change those because uh, that's the way I spell it." Um, famously, Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, um, you know, the plural of, or if, if you're saying something is of elves, it's supposed to be in the English language. It's supposed to be elf, elfin. That is elfin, but he did not like that because. For whatever reason, he didn't like it. And so he changed elfin to elfish or elvish or elven, elvin instead of elfish or elfin um, and things along those lines. So, and that's his style. So it was in his style manual when, you know, of course, he edited himself. Okay, so there's this book and then there's other books on the market, Perfect English Grammar. I have a few of these examples. Um, now these, these guides have, uh, you know, they tell you how to, there's one on punctuation showing you how to do a period. Uh, ending a sentence, things like that. Um, it's just basic grammar knowledge. These books are good resources. Um, here's another one, like I said, or toot my own horn a little bit. I've actually written one. So this is my grammar book. Um, and I put a lot of stuff in here that's more oriented towards authorship. So, and it's available everywhere, but you by no means have to get mine. Um, yes, I do put stuff in here that helps with authorship, but so does this book. And so does this book and just about any other grammar book that you can find out there. Um, you know, of course, I'm going to be biased towards my own, but, you know, All right, there's one other resource that you could use to help you with editing, uh, and that's Google. Google it. Uh, the reason why I leave that one last is because you're trusting that people who 
answer your Google question or uh, the website that you land on that it's reputable and that it's not, you know, there's other, there's other countries that use English. There's the UK, of course, and they're going to have different spellings. Uh, there's Australian, there's South African, there's American, of course, and all of them have not only just different spellings, but they have some different rules and stuff. So you're trusting uh, the website. So I would trust a book probably more than I would trust Google but Google in a pinch will work. Um, it, you know, you can kind of filter through and figure out uh, who's reputable and who's not. You can probably tell pretty quickly. And um, another thing with Google that you can do is if you're not really sure, you can get several different opinions. There's lots of people on Google. So you can, uh, if I if I ever have a question that I'm kind of questionable about, I'll Google it in diff by wording it differently several different times. And if all the advice is still the same, then I'm like, okay, well, then they know what they're talking about. Um, if it's wildly different and I'm like not sure about it, because I'm like, okay, this person says this and this person says that, and I don't know which one to trust, I'll go to a style manual or I'll go to my, uh, it's not my own book, but I'll go to one of these books, one of, in my library. I have an extensive library, of course, being an English teacher of books that I used to teach with and things like that before I wrote wrote my grammar novel. My grammar novel was written, not novel. My grammar book was written this year, 2023. So before then I use these other books and so forth. There's another book out there that I recommend that I don't have a copy of anymore because I gave it away to somebody. It's called Woe is I. Woe is I. And um, it's out there and it's, it's a pretty good grammar book as well. They'll teach you how to do it. Um, in my book, I teach you things like how do you do commas and stuff, but you know, you can find it here on this YouTube channel as well. I have one that tells you how to use commas and where to use them. Basically, anytime you have a um, phrase, you know, difference between a clause and a phrase, a phrase in the English language is a group of words that does not contain both a subject and a verb. It can contain both or neither, but it I mean, contain one or neither, but it cannot contain both. If it contains both a subject and a verb, it's a clause. So if a phrase opens a sentence, like a prepositional phrase or a participial phrase, or any kind of phrase opens a sentence, you usually always put a comma after it, after the after the phrase. If it if there's two phrases, like at the end of a long day is two prepositional phrases. If it's two phrases, then you put a comma after it. Uh, the rule with prepositional phrases, the rule of thumb is if it's three words or fewer, like um, like over the mountains we traveled. Over the mountains is only three words. You wouldn't really need a comma there because you know it's it's understood. Uh, however, if you put a comma there, it would not be wrong. But if it's like over the Rocky Mountains we travel, if it's four words or more, you're supposed to put a comma. But um, if you're one to, to error on caution, then any kind of phrase that opens a sentence, no matter how long, put a comma after it. It's fine. Um, but that's that's another grammar lesson. That you know, again, you can find that in my comment lessons. All right. So I don't know where we are on time, but I'm going to jump into um, the. Uh, editing some some editing here so let me share the screen all right so this is a, a chapter out of my um gunpowder magic and lead novel that i'm working on. i picked chapter three because some of the other chapters have some cursing in it and things and and even though it's mild uh for in case there's young ones looking at this or, or college students or well, not college, but, you know, high school students or whatever, I didn't want to have a bunch of even mild cursing in it. Uh, so I picked one that didn't have a lot of cursing or, or anything in it. Um, okay, so this is chapter three, the old place. All right, so the way I edit is, um, okay, this is a prepositional phrase here after about a three-hour ride. Okay, this being a prepositional phrase, of course, there's going to be a comma after it. Um, if it's three words or fewer, you don't have to put a comma, like I said earlier, However, if you don't want to ever make a mistake, it's not wrong to put a comma after a phrase that opens a sentence. Now, if this phrase was at the end of the sentence, like Oren uh, turned off the main road into the woods after about a three-hour ride, if I did it that way, there would be no commas at all because this is the main clause. In other words, it's the main part of the sentence. Now, how do I know this? Because you look it up in the book. 
if you're if you're unsure, you're like, do I put a comma here? You 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 look in a book, or if you're unsure what kind of phrase this is, look up after and see what what kind of speech is after. Google that; it'll tell you it's a preposition. All right. Um, so that's what you do it. Once you get used to that, and you actually learn some of that stuff, and you 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 consult the books and you consult um, Google after a while, and after a few novels, you'll start just picking it up. Um, grammar is very much like a musical instrument. Uh, I actually played bass guitar, and uh, I played trombone in high school and junior high and high school from like fourth grade all the way through senior year. Um, when I first learned how to play the trombone back in fourth grade, we learned the staff, we learned the notes on the staff and where it was on the trombone slide, where the note was, and how, how much force to put in your, your armature on your uh, uh, mouthpiece and things like that. Um, by the time I got to high school, I wasn't thinking, okay, the, the note on the first line of the staff is an F. I wasn't thinking that anymore. I just automatically went to first position and played an F because I, I looked at it. I know where it's at. I know where it's at on my instrument. I just go there and did it. I didn't think about it and I don't have to worry about it. I just knew it. Okay. That's how grammar is. Once you learn it and you, you get the basics down, eventually you, you no longer have to think, do I put a comma there or not? You just do it or don't do it, depending on how what you know. So once you learn it, uh, you just you you pick it up, you just get it. All right. Now, if you're thinking, oh, that's easy for you to say, you have degrees in English. Well, I didn't always have degrees in English. I was a struggling student once. I had trouble with commas big time. I wanted to put a comma anywhere there was a pause in the sentence because I thought that would be a good place for a comma because you know you pause. No, that's not what you. Do. That's not at all what you do. So I mean, I, I got nailed on commas a lot um and i have a lot of grammar in the, on this youtube channel if you want to go back and look at the actual parts of speech grammar it's it's available all right but this is a self-editing class so or video you can tell i'm a teacher all right so here we go so we uh after a three-hour ride comma so i know that's correct right no that's a period because this is a statement there's four types of sentences right and the way you remember the four types of sentences is there's declarative, which is just a statement. You're just saying something, right? There's an interrogative. Interrogative is a question. And the reason why you know it's a question is because when you interrogate somebody, uh, that's where the interrogative, interrogative comes from the word interrogate, you're asking them questions, right? If you're a criminal and you're in a police station and the police are interrogating you, they're asking you questions. So an interrogative sentence is a question. Uh, an imperative is a command. You know, uh, if you work... For living out there in the real world, especially as a teacher, they would used to say things like, we're going to give you an imperative. It meant they were going to give you some sort of command. I just didn't want to call it a command, right? So an imperative uh, always has the understood you as the subject. In other words, like, get me some iced tea or bring me a coffee. Um, you're not saying uh, the subject when you're, when you're using an imperative. When you say bring me coffee or can you uh, bring me, you know, a sandwich, when you're saying it that way, it's understood you. You're actually saying you bring me a sandwich or you bring me coffee. Uh, we just don't say the the understood um, you. If you say, would you bring me some coffee, then that's an interrogative, right? Um, that's a question. And then the last one is the exclamatory sentence. Exclamatory sentences have the, ex the exclamation point on the end and they're, they show emotion. So to recap that, declarative statement, interrogative question, Imperative is a is a command, and a exclamatory is a sentence that has emotion in it. Like, look out, the car's coming, or something, or jump, jump, or whatever. You know, there's uh, jump is kind of a imperative and an exclamatory because it's like saying you jump. So the word jump is a complete sentence, right? Because anyway, we get to you know you know. All right, so if you know those kind of sentences, then you you know that punctuating them is going to be different. This is a declarative because it has a period and not just because it has a period, but it is declarative. It's just a statement. All right. If we're asking a question, it's going to have a question mark. If you're doing, if you're showing emotion, like look out for that car or whatever, you're going to put an exclamation point. Um, in formal writing, as well as in novel writing, your exclamation point, you should only put one. This isn't social media. It's not Facebook where someone's telling you they're having a baby and you're like, congratulations. And you put like 30 exclamation points after it this is this is not that kind of writing 
uh, that that gets your point across in Facebook that you're very excited that they're going to have a baby or whatever, or they're going to graduate high school or whatever. But um, in writing, formal writing and in creative writing like this, one exclamation point is plenty. Um, kind of goes back to the style manual. If your style is putting four or five of them in there, I would caution you heavily on that because I know your editor is going to jump on that if you have an editor. But um, one is supposed to be sufficient. Same thing with the word very or really. You should, probably should not use those words anyway because they're intensifiers. They're an adverb and they're intensifier, meaning that they kick up something a notch. So he's not just busy. He's really busy or he's not running fast. He's running very fast. Again, those words should be, there's other ways to say it, you know, uh, he sped by uh, without regard for, you know, his, uh, the speed or whatever. That's a terrible sentence, but you know what I mean? There's other ways to say it besides very or really. Those are kind of bad adverbs to use. Uh, you should use them very sparingly. The same thing with the word that. The word that could be a relative pronoun. Um like, this is the coffee that I like to buy. Okay, that's correct. That's a correct sentence. This is the coffee that I like to buy. However, it's a bad sentence because you can just say, that is the coffee I buy. Or that's the coffee I like to buy. You don't have to say, that's the coffee that I like to buy. You can just say, that's the coffee I like to buy. And it's a lot smoother and it's better. And you can just eliminate the that. All right, same thing with redundant pronoun. No, wait, redundant prepositions. Redundant prepositions are where you have a preposition that you just don't need. Like he jumped off of the porch. He jumped off of the porch. Okay, off is already a preposition, so is of. So he jumped off of the porch is redundant. You can just say he just he jumped off the porch. He jumped off the porch. Get rid of the of. So thing with um, in Texas we say this a lot where it's like, hey, where's your mom at? Um, and you're like, oh, she's in the back room. Okay, where's your dad at? When all you have to say, you can get rid of the at because it's redundant. You can say, where's your mom? Where's your dad? We don't have to use the at. Where's your dad at? That's a redundant preposition. So kill those. Okay, so that being said, uh, I want to say a couple more things. Um, one thing in case you, if you're using Microsoft Word, uh, then go to, uh, is it insert layout? I think it's layout maybe. Uh, home, uh, hang on a second. I gotta remember where, where to find it. Oh, it's view. You go under view and then you hit navigation pane. And that's what, if you're wondering, that's what pulls up this uh, side over here. Now these are all done because if you go to home and you change your heading, which I did here and your, your body text or your normal here, um, then what it'll do is if you change your heading and you put the chapter and headings in here, it'll put them all out here like this. So this way you can navigate within your, um, so, you know, I haven't, I've gotten those named, but I haven't written them yet. You can navigate between your uh, chapters very easily when you're editing. It makes it a lot easier. Um, so I'm going to end the video here uh, because there's still much, much more I want to say. But the video is already 30 minutes long at this point. And I actually did record some more video. Um, this is me from the future. <laughs> I actually did record the rest of the video. However... It got really long. It was like over an hour long. So uh, um, I'm going to edit it down to about 30 minutes each. So we're going to have a part two. It's going to come up here in a few days. So this is the end of part one. And uh, if you have any questions or anything so far, then go ahead and let me know. Uh, you can send a comment or you can ask me a question or give it to me an email, clevebourbon at clevebourbon.com. But um for now, I just want to stop it here, and in a couple of days, I'll do the next part, and we'll continue on our editing series. Uh, this is probably going to – it probably is going to end up being three parts because there's a lot to self-editing. So this is only the opening salvo. Okay, so anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you very much.